Hey, I'm Elisa. And I'm Jess. And you're watching Geekin' Out. Today we have a bunch of geeky stuff lined up for you, so stay tuned. Oh my god. Oh my god. Arrow. Flash. Flaro. How do you? So Elisa, how do you feel about this crossover? So excited. I could not be more excited about this. The, the shows on the Rona are already so good. Arrow has had a lot of time to build itself up to be great. But the Flash just started and I'm already such a fan. They've done so well with the characters already. And now to see them combine all these great characters, it's gonna be epic. I'm so excited. Do you have any predictions? That's, oh my god, that's such a great question because we have seen them cross over before, right? Mm -hmm. We saw them in season two of Arrow with the scientist and three ghosts, and now we're getting to see them do it again. But last time it was more Barry Allen comes to Starling City, he's just kind of a noob. He doesn't have his powers yet. <laughs> he's, he's, he's just a CSI assistant that's kind of playing hooky from his job. <laughs> he has nothing unique about him in the way of super speed or powers or whatever. Mm -hmm. This time, he is a full-fledged superhero, and judging from the preview, it looks like he's going to go a little bit uh, insane. I don't know <laughs> how that happens, but I'm so excited because Barry is such a kind of a bland, vanilla character, so I'm ready for him to be like, yeah, I'm evil now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's cool that he... Because we've always seen him as this like sweet kind of like I'm just gonna save everybody kind of a thing, like not kind of almost one dimensional in that sense. Yeah, he's got a white knight complex. Yes, um, so it'll be cool to have him change personalities kind of, and for Oliver to come in and have to in a in a way rescue him, and because we've seen Oliver in just the little bits that they've been together, sort of mentor him a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Um, so I get we get to see that continue. But also, aside from Oliver and Barry, we get to see the rest of their teams come together. So we've got Felicity and Diggle. We have Caitlin and um, Cisco. Cisco. Yeah, so it'll be cool to see all of them come together. And um, I think, I wonder what villains we're going to have I know come Captain in here. Boomerang is making an appearance. Uh. Remember um, in one of the last episodes of Arrow, they had that crazy, freaky, supersonic boomerang thing. I'm not yeah. even sure if it was supersonic, but it was just like an angry boomerang. Mm -hmm. That guy, he yeah. was so creepy, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> he was scary, yeah. It freaks me out a little bit. It and his weapon is so, like, crazy. I would never watch that episode again in the dark by myself. <laughs> yeah. That is a no. bad idea. It's worse than a horror movie. No, but yeah, he should be a good villain. And uh, I, whatever villain um, changes Barry's um, mindset kind of a thing is going to be cool. But is it going to be a villain or is it going to be mm. Dr. Wells? Because he mm. is really shifty. He's and you already know my position on him yeah. and his he's, fake wheelchair. Yes. He's not cool. He's very sketchy. Especially after the last one when he... Well, we won't spoil it for anybody, but it's okay, boy. he's very creepy. And it'll be cool to see maybe what the Arrow team thinks about Dr. Wells, because now they'll kind of all be in the same general area. The journey ends here. We talked The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. It is time for you to know what really happened. We're going to talk about a movie that I believe all three of us are a fan of, um, and that's The Hobbit, which is more than one movie, actually. But we're going to talk about all three. Um, what is your favorite thing about The Hobbit? So far? Yeah, so far. <laughs> uh, it's tough to pin it down to one specific thing, but obviously Smaug is awesome. Benedict Cumberbatch, Hollywood's new geek boy, whatever you would call him, <laughs> does a wonderful job. I am So that's very exciting, and I know he's also doing the sorcerer, or Saruman, or Sauron, my bad. Yes. But does he do the voice of both? Yeah, he does. That's and awesome. It is super awesome. So I'm very excited to see how that develops in the next and the final segment of the Hobbit trilogy. Yes. So that's probably what I'm most looking forward to so far. What about you, Dyson? Uh, I don't know. Every time I, I, I watch uh, the movie, I'm really excited about I'm a Sherlock fan. Um, so Martin Freeman and Benedict Cumberbatch are uh, pretty much like the dynamic duo. So 
uh, when I find them interacting uh, in the opposite way, where the one's evil and one's good. And so you got Benedict Cumberbatch as the dragon, uh, Martin as uh, the Hobbit. It it it's a really interesting dynamic. Truly, you are mistaken, though. Smaug, chiefest and greatest of calamities. You have nice. I, I'm always excited about how they interact because you know that right after this they're gonna go back to Sherlock, so it's gonna be <laughs> really funny. Like some sort of chemistry there. Yeah. I like about the it wasn't in the first one, but Legolas is in the second one, and he's not in the book. Is he in the append? The or the is he? Or the I guess he's not like remember? really part of the yeah, main not story. part of the main storyline. Yeah, but they've added him to be more of like a main character in the movie, and I love that because it's super cool that you have this like other fighting element. Because when the dwarves fight, it's not really like, it's not. It's more brawny. Yeah, it's, it's not, not It's as not as, so like, much as like elegant. a life skill type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. The elegance of the elves. Yes, I love mm. that. So it's super cool. And of course, because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, you bring back memories and you bring back <laughs> Legolas, which is great. And Gandalf too. Um, he's such a huge part of both trilogies and he's the greatest character all the time. Um, so yeah, what do you, I know Dyson has a bone to pick about the music in the I hate the music, but it is so <laughs> Okay, hard. that is actually the worst. The music is awesome. I know. It's, it's so good. I agree. Yeah. It's so lame. I mean, I get it. It's the, it's the cutesy, cartoony dwarves now, but I mean, I hate, I hate the music that they do. I, I the feel like the best. that's one of the worst. Actually, the Goblin King was the worst one for me because I'm sitting there and I hate musicals. And all of a sudden I'm sitting in a musical and I just want to leave. I. I don't care about <laughs> Goblin Town or any of that, and I'm just sitting there going, yeah, uh, can we go back to the storyline, please? Because I don't understand why we're here. And even when you were upset because I was making fun of the chants that they did, you pay how much money to have an orchestra soundtrack your movie, and then you make me watch these dwarves who don't know how to actually sing. Oh my gosh, they definitely know how to sing. And sing to me <laughs> for five the minutes? No, I'm not okay with that. The low tones were so beautiful and so perfect. Yeah, it'd be even oh, better with a I trained totally musician. It was, like, it was almost like monk chant. It, it fit really well with the time. If I want to like watch a monk chant, I'll go to in. Geography Channel or something and watch monks chant. But guys, aside from the chanting, in the trailer for The Battle of the Five Armies, the newest Hobbit movie, in the trailer, they play Pippin's song, which was in, I believe, uh, Return of the King, which gave me crazy goosebumps. So are we okay with that music? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like it song. when it serves a purpose. I'm okay <laughs> yeah. with that. But when it doesn't serve a purpose, I mean, it just served a purpose. Don't put it in. got me really excited for the movies. <laughs> <laughs> music is never a problem, in my opinion. It doesn't matter if it's chanting or if it's one person singing. It doesn't matter. Anyway, we can agree that we're excited for agree the music. Agree to disagree regardless about the music. <laughs> yeah, we can disagree about the music, but we can agree that we're excited for the trilogy to, well, Very. I'm not excited for it to finish, but the new movie. I think the, the, the new one is going to be the best one of the three segments. I think so, so too. So I'm very excited. Yeah, we're all excited. It's going to be great. Thanks for hanging out and talking about The Hobbit. We'll see you next week. This behind the world ahead and there are many paths to tread through shadow to our resident game geek Steven Sobot talked the good, the great, and the amazing of Far Cry 4. This will soon be behind us, and we'll be off on a grand adventure. Because I have cleared my calendar for you. You and I. Sometimes, video games create enemies who are more likable than the protagonist. This is probably because games try to make the protagonist a blank slate so the player can project themselves on them. It's not hard for writers to create someone more interesting than a generic action hero. A good example of this would be Voss from Far Cry 3. While he clearly is the enemy, having tortured you and killed your brother, he has moments of brilliance that really stick with you. The definition of insanity is insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over again to change that is crazy
So will the next game's antagonist be as memorable as the previous? Well, let's see. Far Cry 4 is the fourth installment of the action-adventure first-person shooter series developed by Ubisoft. You play as Ajay Gale, a young man who's traveling to the fictional country of Karat to bring his mother's ashes there as her last wish. His bus gets stopped by the Karate military and he is met face-to-face -face with Karat's king and the primary antagonist, Pagan Min. You escape capture and meet up with the Golden Path, a revolutionary group fighting against Pagan Min's tyranny. Far Cry 4's setting of Kirat is very similar to Nepal in the Himalayas. Since much of the area is mountainous and forested, you get around by ziplining and mountain climbing. Once you've discovered location, you can quick travel to the different places you've been to. I find quick travel breaks your immersion in the game, but I think it'd be really annoying to scale up a mountainside for 5 minutes every time you need to replenish your supplies. Like in many Far Cry games, the local wildlife is a secondary enemy which can be either a hindrance or help. You can collect bait from dead animals to throw, attracting predators that will attack anyone near it. This kind of feels like calling for reinforcements, except they're ravenous beasts who don't like you either. One of the biggest selling points to the game is the character of Pagon Min, featured heavily in trailers and on the game cover. Pagon Min is a crazy, maniacal, twisted man who rules Karat with a combination of military strength and propaganda. However, his flair really shines and makes him a likable character. Oh, would you hold this? For just a moment, I want to get a little picture right into the camera. There we are. Awesome. However, after the intro cutscene, you hear from him again, not angry that you left the dinner he ordered for you. RJ, my boy, are you busy? You don't mind me calling, do you? Fantastic. You really are an excellent listener. Look, no hard feelings about the crab rangoon. I know it's not to everyone's taste. But you'll be pleased to know I had the chef executed for his incompetence. Or was it his family we killed? I feel like the developers try to make Pagan Min as likable as possible to almost a degree of forcing it. I remember overhearing a rumor that you can beat the game in 10 minutes. Apparently, when Pagan Min says, Don't move. I will be right back. If you wait for 10 minutes, he comes back and you see an alternate ending. I mean, realistically, when a man who has a whole army under his control and kills his own soldiers because they almost killed you asks you to wait a minute, I'd wait a minute. That's just common courtesy. I... W wait, what? He returns. Seriously? Damn. Oh, okay, well, uh, better not spoil too much of the game. Far Cry 4 is available on Steam. PlayStation 3 and 4, and Xbox 360 and 1. Peeking Out takes a look at Jurassic World's new trailer. I'm really proud of you for going on this trip. You're going to have so much fun. And remember, if something chases you, run. Just over six months before the movie's release date, Universal Studios released the trailer to the upcoming fourth film in the Jurassic Park franchise, two days prior to its announced release date. We're slowly introduced into this new park as we head across the ocean to the now fully functional Isla Nubar that was featured in the first film. The first dinos we're introduced to are Gallimimus galloping around a full tour's van in a shot reminiscent of a similar scene featuring Dr. Grant with the two children in the first film. We're shown orb-like vehicles traveling under rather large sauropods. Do they really expect us to believe no one's been crushed yet? Tourists kayaking through a river surrounded by stegosauruses. And then the real show begins. The first minute and 15 seconds of the trailer brings to life every single one of my childhood fantasies. This is the Jurassic Park of my dreams. But as we all know, what's a Jurassic Park movie without fear and playing God? Apparently, the scientists at the park didn't learn from the mistakes 20 years ago and are once again hell-bent on taking things too far. And then we just went and made a new dinosaur? Probably not a good idea. Suffice to say, Ian Malcolm's words from 20 years ago ring true. I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. And life finds a way to send the vacationer-filled park into shambles. The trailer gives us a real feel for leading man Chris Pratt's role as a member of Jurassic World's on-site staff who conducts behavioral research on the Velociraptors. 
He seems to me to be a bit of a cross between Robert Muldoon and Dr. Grant with his tough but knowledgeable demeanor. Here's hoping for Pratt's sake, he doesn't meet a clever girl. Clever girl. Pratt provides the voice of reason when he hears of the park's scientist experiments, and evidently, just like in the first film, no one listens until it's too late. Bryce Dallas Howard plays one of the park's scientists and is shown in a scene eerily reminiscent of Dr. Ellie Sattler's generator scene with the raptor from the first film. The trailer has only increased my expectations for the film. So have you heard about all the reboot action happening lately? Yeah, I totally reboot? have. Reboot? Have you girls heard about the new reboot reboot? It's gonna be like the, the best reboot since forever. Oh god, who let Steven out of his cage? Our geeky guys talked all about the new reboot reboot. Reboot. I come from the net. From systems, peoples, and cities to this place. Mainframe. Welcome to our discussion of uh, Reboot. Uh, here with me are Dyson and Justin. I'm Steven. So Dyson, what's ex exactly happening with Reboot? Well, um, we all know it's, well, we might not all know. Uh, it's the 20th uh, anniversary of Reboot, which uh, aired in September 10th, 1994. If you feel old, yeah, get in line. Um, but yeah, on their 20th anniversary, um, Rainmaker just up and decided to create a post saying that they were going to start working on a new reboot, including a teaser uh, featuring the incoming game. Everyone remembers the giant uh, rectangle coming down, dropping from the sky. Warning, incoming game. Got goosebumps seeing that. Um, the interesting thing is they're not going to uh, start where they left off. Uh, they're actually going to aim for a new generation of reboot fans and they are going to start in a whole new universe, they say. So that leaves the question whether we should get excited or incredibly scared as to whether they are going to uh, betray this uh, series or utterly destroy it. I am personally excited. I know. I'm not the only one that's excited. Uh, Steven, how are you feeling about this? Uh, I really liked Reboot as a, as a show. Uh, it was uh, kind of a bit of a, my childhood. Per, I, I always loved like the whole 3D graphics. Uh, I, if I've, watched, I've watched all the, the show about three times, and I've realized that season one and two, that's kind of the cheesy stuff most people remember. They're going inside games. Graphics are significantly more polygon-esque. But then when they go into the season three and four, the, the show gets a little bit not exactly super gritty or super intense, but it changes from campy and colorful to kind of a little, little bit more grim. Undead before dawn! Undead before dawn! Game over. And uh, the whole city of Mainframe getting destroyed. So if they do something like that, something that's a little bit they kind of have this character arc where they have relatively acceptable characters. I really like the characters. Then maybe they'll make a decent show. Justin? See, I don't, I really, I loved their reboot when it was on and why reboot it? Like it was perfect as it was, don't mess with a good thing. Like I think the show was such a product of the 90s where say what you want, you didn't really know what was the internet, how it worked, how any of that worked. So this show that kind of in effect made it like the basis was this is how it works inside your computer, Alatron, was really neat and it was such a product of the 90s and they just won't be able to recapture it so why try? It's just going to come out lame and crappy, I think. True. It might do that. Uh, I am trying to be hopeful. Uh, Dyson, any, yeah. any thoughts on that? No, I'm definitely hopeful. I, the one thing that, you know, I was initially going, I don't know how you're going to bring that uh, that style of, of a show, especially just the 3D-esque sort of thing, we're way beyond that technologically. Um, how do you bring that to a new audience? Uh, but you know, I think we're, we're not giving kids enough credit. Like, that's, that's something that's it's interesting and new to them, even if it's old to us. Uh, so I think it, it can work, and I think if they do the storyline story right, uh, there's nothing to really worry about. Uh, but that's up to them. So. Uh, so, uh, I would have to say, uh, I mean, we'll have to look for it. Uh, I guess uh, when it comes out, no one knows for sure, but we intend to find out.
the harmless plug into the end scenario of reboot. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> No one knows for sure, but I intend to find out. Reboot! There's one superhero, Jess, who's much more patriotic than all the others. His name is Captain Kanak. <laughs> the lines were long at Hamilton Comic Con as fans eagerly awaited to meet Captain Kanak, the iconic Canadian superhero. Captain Canuck was created by Richard Comley in 1976. Issue number one came out and Captain Canuck Incorporated formed um, approximately three years ago and revitalized uh, the captain with this as you see right now. In a small way Mohawk College played a part in that. In 2006 I was asked to participate in creating a, a course, a one-year postgraduate course uh, for comic book uh, illustration and scripting and always treated my students well with um, free comics, free Captain Canal comics. In those days I had lots to give away, uh, not anymore. Now they're getting to be more expensive collector's items. So next year is our 40th anniversary. We have a lot of stuff happening next year. Uh, a new miniseries, uh, another summer special, uh, interesting thing about this issue is very first time a governor general has ever written a letter for a comic book series in history. Well, it's iconic. It's you know, it's probably the only real Canadian superhero that you really identify. You know, with the Canadian flags all over him, like you can't can't mistake him for anything else. I mean, we we have we like to have great ties with comic book and comic strips, and it's amazing feature films how they've uh, they've taken every comic book idea and put it on the film. And Captain Canuck is certainly no exception to the current trend. Uh, there's still a, a feature film in the works. Uh, second draft of the screenplay has been completed, so that's moving ahead. The future is certainly shining bright for this Canadian hero. There's a time of year that all geeks love. It's Christmas! <laughs> Our geeks gave you a holiday wish list for the geek in your life. So let's start with Justin. Well, um, I'm going to go really expensive for the uh, man in your life, so to say. Um, 470 bucks, you can get a nice uh, PS4. It's white and it comes with the game Destiny, which is the best game on the PS4. And it just looks really sleek and really nice. So if you want to treat uh, that special someone, then that's the way to go. Okay, Jess. All right, so for my geeky gift, I went with something a little bit more practical that you can use year round because I think Christmas gifts should be gifts that you can use all the time. They shouldn't be restricted to the season. So I went with three different nightlights that you can get at thisiswhyimbroke.com and you have Thor, Spider-Man, Captain America. There's a bunch of other ones up there, but they're between 30 and $50 because every hero needs a light in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I have a nightlight, but it's definitely not as cool as like a Spider-Man or a Thor nightlight. All right, let's move to Steven. If you have a friend and such, and you each want to play a game that's kind of a tag team, great to play with. Uh, Pokemon uh, Alpha, uh, Alpha Sapphire and Omega Ruby just came out. It's the remake of uh, the third generation of Pokemon games. Uh, one of you gets one, the other one gets the other. You each intermingle which game, which Pokemon you each get, and then you play together. It's uh, Pokemon's one of the greatest games you can get on the 3DS, and you can argue whether it is or not, but. I'm going to state that clearly because it is fact. So uh, it's it's a great gift. It's not super expensive, but forty dollars and Pokemon goes way back. Everybody knows and loves Pokemon. Even if they didn't watch it, they know who Pikachu is. I mean, come on, if you don't know, there's something wrong. He's the water one. I'm <laughs> <laughs> like a true fan. <laughs> What's your favorite geek gift? So right now I'm thinking um, on thinkgeek.com, you can get this really cool mug and it looks like one of the pipes, the one of the green pipes from Mario. And it's only like 12 or $13 plus, plus tax and shipping. So it's pretty cheap. And maybe just include some hot chocolate or coffee in there. Cause you know, those are, well, not really Christmassy drinks, kind of, but every geek needs caffeine boost with their geeky cup so they can stay up all night watching TV or playing video games. At least I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Who doesn't love mugs too? Like, yeah, everybody needs their cool. little personalized geek mug. Well, I think a uh, flash and arrow would make a great uh, Christmas <laughs> gift because there's nothing better than just snuggling up on the couch, a 
cold Christmas night underneath a blanket and chucking those into the fire because they're great <laughs> kindling. Christmas, get a Steam gift card for anyone who loves PC games. Uh, not only are you giving them awesome time to spend money on whatever indie game or whatever they choose to work with, you're giving the developers some support to make those games better. And that's just spreading the Christmas cheer. <laughs> so there you go. You're so good at spreading Christmas cheer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Throw things in the fire and then play computer games. OK. What <laughs> more would you want out of life, really? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the fire. Um, <laughs> my <laughs> favorite geek gift right now, because there, we just started talking about the um, Suicide Squad movie. So I'm all like back in my Harley Quinn phase. And I just saw this awesome hoodie that has, it's like a Harley Quinn costume, but it's, you know, a little zip up sweater. And it has like a bit, her, um, what do you call it? Like her jester hat. Yeah. So that is part of the hood. It'll keep you warm over the Christmas winter season. And it's so cool for like a, someone who loves someone who wants to snuggle up the whole joker and <laughs> Yeah, next to their joke. If they had a joker hoodie, yeah. you could make that a combined like couple gift. That would be awesome. And I also saw, this is like super Elisa geeky because I love Breaking Bad. I came across Converse sneakers with Breaking Bad painted on them. There's like Walter White on one shoe and Jesse Pinkman on the other shoe. And I would wear them all the time because Breaking Bad is great. Anyway, those are my... What? It's really rough to break those in. So, uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so we've all got through our best list of geek gifts for the ultimate geek in your life and um merry christmas to all our geeks who are watching and we'll see you after the break thanks for watching Enjoy our show we'll catch you next time on geeking out girls can i can i come up i i'm hungry i don't have enough fish heads and i just i just i just i'm really hungry now and i just...